Thank you for joining me for another edition of Take 5. It's here on a, I believe it's a Thursday, right? A lot of you are on spring break as well as I am. And so the days sort of blend together. But we hope that you'll be joining us on the 27th at 10 o'clock on Sunday as we gather back together and we continue in our teaching series called Redefine. If you're new with our Take 5 segment, and this is where I take five minutes and give a bit of a preview of what we're going to be discussing on Sunday. So if you've been around the parts, I guess, for the last uh, couple months, we've been on this teaching series called Redefine, where we're looking at the words of Jesus and we're looking at redefinitions that he, um, these little statements all over the Gospels where he says, if you want to find your life, you need to lose your life for my sake. It's a redefinition of purpose. Uh, and in fact, the very first sermon that we have recorded of Jesus, the famous Sermon on the Mount, those first statements called the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are persecuted, blessed are the meek. I mean, those are um, redefinitions of what it means to be blessed. And it's all over, you know, the Gospels. If you want to be greatest in my kingdom, learn to be the least, right? And so we've been looking at the greatest man that has ever lived, a guy by the name of John the Baptist, getting a different view or an idea of the definition of greatness from the from the eyes of the really the only one who matters, Jesus. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at chapter 2 and chapter 3 in the book of Revelation. And the reason, reason why is because uh, many of you perhaps are familiar, Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, it was a uh, it was a revelation that was given to the disciple John when he was very old, probably in his 90s at this time. Rome had sent him to this island really just to shut him up because he refused to he refused to keep quiet uh, preaching about the resurrected Jesus. So Rome didn't want to make a martyr of John as they often did with a number of the other disciples. John's the only one left. Probably feels like he's just waiting to die, and yet God had other plans for John. Gives him this revelation. Uh, he writes it down as the best as he possibly can about things that were, perspective of the past, things that are, the things that are going on in the present, and then obviously revelation, the things that are to come. And in the second and third chapter, Jesus addresses seven actual literal churches that this letter, Revelation, would have originally been given to. It would have been uh, delivered, you know, by traveler, by messenger to these seven gatherings uh, in these various cities. And what it does is that Jesus is the only one because the bride, the church, Jesus calls his church the bride of Christ. Beauty is in the eye of the only one that matters, the eye of the beholder. Jesus is the beholder. And so Jesus is the one who is allowed because he has the authority and the right and because he sees clearly to define what makes his bride beautiful and also what keeps his bride from being beautiful, right? He gets to define success. He gets to define beauty. He gets to de uh, decide what it means to be a great gathering of believers, right? It's so interesting that when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist, and, and Jesus said this about John. He said, there is no one born among women greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, according to the words of Jesus, the greatest man who ever lived. But before Jesus made that statement, Jesus also said this to the crowd. And this is my translation of Jesus's words. You missed greatness. Because, because John did not fit your definition of what you believed a great man should be, you expected him to dance. You expected him to say this. You expected him to do this. You expected him to be a certain way. And because he was not, because of the way that he looked, because of the way that he acted, because of him not fitting your definition of greatness, you missed out on greatness. Then after that, Jesus actually even alludes to himself that there would be many people that would miss out on the Messiah, Jesus, the, the Savior, because of preconceived notions of what the Messiah should look like. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples, a guy by the name of Judas, became disillusioned with Jesus, even though he saw the power of, of the miracles and the power of Jesus' teachings and, and, and spent, you know, three years with him. Because Jesus did not fit Judas's definition of who the Messiah should be, 
he rejected him. Now, why am I telling you this? Because we are on the verge of looking at a church in chapter three of the book of Revelation, the church of Philadelphia, this gathering of believers. It was a great church. In fact, this church receives nothing but, but commendation and, and, and praise. But yet it would probably, a, probably be a church that most of us would dismiss. Because Jesus says about this church, I know that you have little strength. What does that mean? Well, probably little influence, little power, probably little in numbers. But yet this gathering of believers in this church, this, this city of Philadelphia, they were giants. They were faithful. And Jesus has nothing but positive things to say about this gathering of believers that most people would have considered and just disregard it as, as a failure. I hope that you join us at 10 o'clock on the 27th, the Sunday coming up here in March. I know we're at the tail end of spring break. We got a big day planned, not only at 10 o'clock for our gathering, but also for our students meeting at the YMCA at six o'clock. We're gonna play a little dodgeball, have a little swimming. Uh, we're gonna be combining that with a couple other youth ministries. We hope that you, and if you, especially if you have a teenager, a uh, middle school or junior higher or high school student, that you get them there at the Y. Uh, We'll see you on Sunday. God bless. Have a great day.